Good afternoon. I'm your host, Bridgetti Lambanda, coming to you from Cape Town in South Africa, and I'm winged by two gentlemen this, this, this afternoon, and I'm feeling very underqualified sitting in their midst. On the one hand, I have Peter Rosewarn, whom you have all met before. Um, both my guests today are, are water experts. Peter Rosewarn has got a BSc Honours in degree in Geology and an MSc in Hydrogeology and over 40 years of experience in groundwater related projects. Peter has worked on groundwater supply and mining projects in South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, uh, Mozambique, Tanzania and Chile. He's also carried out groundwater supply investigations for a number of municipalities. Currently, he's working as an independent groundwater consultant based in Cape Town, and he has a very keen interest in the city's water issues. Also with me is Dr. Anthony Turton. Anthony is a water resource specialist specializing in, in water as a national security risk. He is the former Deputy Governor of the World Water Council. He's also the former Vice President of the International Water Resource Association, as well as a former Intelligence Officer, founding member of the SA Secret Service, where he was a specialist in water as a national security. Now, that to me is of particular interest because we have reached the point now where the our water situation not only in Cape Town but in other parts of South Africa um, to me has turned into a national security risk. How do we um, mitigate this risk? Is it time for us to panic? Is it time to, to pack our bags and start making plans to leave the country? Um, or is there a solution? Is this doable? I, I'm almost feeling that we're kind of at the 11th hour. Um, a lot of people don't understand how we got here. Um, can, we, can we get out of the situation? Is, the, is there hope for us? Um, Anthony, I'm going to let you go first. Is, can, can you explain to us how did we get to the point where we are putting 4 million people at risk? Okay, uh, thanks, Bikiti. It's uh, That is a seemingly seductively simple question, but it's actually very complex. Uh, so let me try and unpack the complexity as best I can. South Africa has always been a water-constrained country. And uh, for 350 years, we've done extraordinarily uh, clever things to manage our way out of our water insecurity. And this... Um, at a sort of at, at an intellectual level, if you like, let's 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 talk about the intellectual level because that I think is where it should start. What we've managed to do is over time we've met, we've mobilised an enormous amount of technical ingenuity, technical capability, to the extent that South Africa, as one of the the, the most water constrained countries in the world, has, for example, the most diversified economy in the world for the type of ecosystem it found itself in. We, are, we need to be compared, for example, to the pampas of Argentina, to the steppes of Russia, to the, uh, to the, uh, the Great Plains of, uh, of, of, of uh, North America, uh, where there's very little, very little economic diversity other than, than, than steppe-based agriculture or, uh, or uh, you know, sort of very rudimentary agriculture. So we've done very clever things with our water. And in the context of South Africa, by virtue of the goal that we've had as a, as a blessing, we have uh, done an amazing thing in the sense that we built a city on one of the few cities in the world, in fact, the only that I know of, that's not on a river, not on a lake, not on a waterfront, on a continental watershed divide. So what we've done over 350 years is we've been pushing rivers around, and we have, to, to, to quote one of my favorite philosophers, uh, we have become masters, uh, René Descartes, his name was, we have become masters and owners of nature. Now, that's all very good and well to become a master and owner of nature, but you then get locked into a technology race, and that implies that you have to continue 
to be smarter and smarter and smarter. Because you, if not, you start becoming a victim of the unintended consequences of your own smartness. So now what we've done is, for example, if you focus on the city of Cape Town, what has happened, uh, if you go back to the history of Cape Town, uh, in 1650s, Jan van Riebeck uh, settled there uh, simply because there was a high level of water security in a very small isolated geographic area that was surrounded by by sub some substantial deserts, the uh, the Marma Desert to the northwest, to the uh, the the, uh, the Karoo uh, immediately on the hinterland, and the, the Kalahari further north. So you have this little isolated area of relative abundance, and I talk about relative abundance because it was created by orographic rain, that is, that is rainfall that arises from the precipitation of warm, moist winds coming off the ocean, hitting the mountain range, going up the mountain range, changing altitude, precipitation point is reached, and therefore you get a high level of precipitation. So if you look at a, at a, at a hydrological map of South Africa, you'll find there's a little sliver of blue around the southern portion of South Africa, particularly around the Table Mountain area. And what that has done is it's a very localized area of relative abundance, and that has fed over time a substantial groundwater resource in the form of the Table Mountain Cattle Group and others. There, there, there are three at least uh, groups that Peter knows more about those than I do, so I will defer to his technical knowledge on those matters. But the important thing is that when the first European settlers came, they came to that place uh, that had been named by the Khoi people, uh, Hamisa, Hamisa, the place of the place of sweet waters, because of the abundance, the relative abundance of water. And that water came uh, actually from the the uh, the interface, uh, the geological interface. Uh, Peter will explain more about this. Of the of the uh, just at the base of the Table Mountain, uh, uh, there's actually a geological interface there, and that was the origin of all of these uh, many many small little relatively short rivers, but fairly reliable rivers. So we've started out, you can almost say the civilization, or no, I wouldn't say the civilization, we've started out the, the settlement, the European settlement, let's call it the quest for, for modernity. We've started modernity in Cape Town by originally harnessing the waters of the Khamisa system, which are dependent on the aquifers that, that sustain them. And from that moment onwards, We've started manipulating the water resources to the extent that we've created artificial levels of, uh, of security such that people can now settle. Now, if we take that as the background, what happened now in, the, let's say, the last 100 years? The last 100 years, the city of Cape Town has become a very important uh, uh, eco econ economic hub in its own right. And the unfortunate part is, as uh, 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 during the period... 1948 to 1994, uh, the period of active apartheid, there was influx control and the movement of people was prevented. So unfortunately, now what has happened in, uh, uh, when we became a democracy, uh, of course, the first thing that needed to happen was influx control was abolished. And that immediately changed a set of dynamics that were of fundamental importance because you now got the free movement of people, which is entirely right. It should be like that. I'm not in any way critical of that. This, but the free movement of people now changed the hydraulic balance uh, within that region in a fundamental way. Because when, when many, many people settled there, and it's, it's their right to do so, as I say, but, 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 but we now get a situation where people demand water not only to drink, and this is where our problem is right now, we're only talking about drinking water. People also need water to sustain the jobs and the economy that, that they need to subsist on. So, on the one hand, where we are today now, subsequent to 1994, is we have an incredible growing demand for water on the one hand. And on the, on the other hand, it is constrained by the available water supply, which is very sophisticated. We've got a, a interbasin transfer system there, cascading water from one river to another along this, this little area of a relative abundance I've explained. And we've reached the limit of what we can do with the available technologies that we have. So now, on top of this, we've got another, another compounding factor, and that compounding factor is climate change. Climate change has now caused some fairly serious uh, disturbances to the distribution of rainfall, and we can park that on one side, but that's an important issue in its own right. And then, of course, we've got 350 years of development now, 
that has unfortunately taken place on top of, an, of, of these three significant aquifers. So we've now got the cumulative impact of that development, which includes pollution, uh, return flows, uh, abstraction, over abstraction, call it what you want to, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we find ourselves today. We've been very clever for the last 350 years by, by mobilizing what I call the paradigm of scarcity. And the paradigm of scarcity means that because we are water scarce, what we have to do is get more water. And by getting more water, we've been clever in that, but we've gone as far as we can. It's, it's, we can't get any more water based on the current paradigm of scarcity. And therefore, what each person is now doing is they think of a pizza pie with all the slices. Each legitimate water user is now uh, chasing their little sliver of that pie. What we need to do is the new paradigm of abundance. And the paradigm of abundance is something that, uh, that, that has got a good future for us all because that is based on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, the physics and chemistry of water, which is a fundamental truth. Uh, no one can argue against that. It's an irrefutable truth that water is a flux moving in time and space. It is a relatively, it, 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 it is, it is a, a renewable resource. And because it's a flux moving in time and space, our constraints are not water. Our constraints are technology and capital. How much technology and how much capital do we bring to that sector in order to start uh, mobilizing additional water, what is known as new water? So that is, the, that is the perspective that I come from. That is my understanding of these matters. And if, and be, and if you incorrectly uh, define what your problem is, then the, if your problem is water scarcity, then you've got a hammer in your hand and everything looks like a nail because uh, you are limited by that paradigm. So we've got to shift to this new paradigm of abundance. And in that paradigm of abundance, we have to understand that we are at the limit of our available water, but that's only our available water. Doesn't mean to say there is no other water out there. And then we have to start thinking very cleverly about creating uh, policy certainty. I'm a policy person. So policy certainty is very, very, very important. I can't overstress how important policy certainty is because policy certainty enables capital to be deployed. Now, I'm going to just close off by saying that uh, I'll make a statement now and I'll, I'm more than willing to debate the statement. There is an infinite supply of technology. We are not technology constrained. There are a, a, a limitless number of potential solutions to this problem. And I've also recently been involved in a number of very high level capital uh, uh, meetings. I, I, I do a lot of work in the, uh, in the, in the financial services sector, advising uh, institutional investors, etc. So I'm fairly plugged into the capital side of things. And I just recently, one, just one fund alone came to me and said, they've got 2 billion rand. Where can they deploy it? Another fund uh, that I'm involved in, 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 in a peripheral way, is talking about raising 10 billion rand, possibly as much as 100 billion rand. They're looking for projects to put into. Now, they can't do that unless there is policy certainty. And at the moment, the policy certainty has, <laughs> has reflected in the way that, that uh, the, the current terms of reference have been framed for the, uh, for the tender documents that have gone out for the current solution, which has, has not created policy certainty. Therefore, you don't have sophisticated technologies coming in and you don't have enough capital to do it. So you want a suboptimal solution uh, and uh, that I think is the tragedy of the moment. So that's, that's a, a lot that I've said, but that's my point of departure. Fantastic. Now, there's a big bone of contention at the moment considering where we are and um, maybe, Peter, I can throw this bone at you. Um, a lot of people are up in arms. There was a, a video footage out yesterday about the Tevardas Kloof Dam. Considering where we are at now, um, people are up in arms because of the amount of water that is being released to the farmers. Should that be happening? Shouldn't it be happening? Um, considering where we are at. I understand the farmers need water. Can I put that to you? What is your what is your feeling on that? Uh, that's a tricky one for me. I'm just a simple uh, geohydrologist or hydrogeologist. They're both the same thing. Um, if I can rather turn your question a bit around to T. Vazas Cleef Dam and the, what the impact might be on its current state in terms of the, the city's uh, TNG aquifer exploitation uh, program. 
Is that okay with you? Sure. Um, just looking at those photographs yesterday, my understanding is that the city intends to drill uh, production boreholes around the main dams of Cape Town, which is T. Butters Kloof, uh, Vemersook, and Steenbrass. Those are the three main ones that are on the TNG catchment or catchments. And looking at that, uh, and what they intend to do is pump the water out and let it gravitate into those dams. And my understanding is there won't be big pipelines taking the water to uh, the treatment plants. It'll be gravitated into those dams. Now, if you look at those pictures of T. Butters Kloof, if you draw balls around that dam and pump the water into that, so what I could mainly see is a wasteland, a sand, a sandy dust bowl. Might as well just leave the water in the ground because you're just going to pump it out and it's just going to infiltrate into that sand and also evaporate. So I'm not sure if the state of the dam now will mean that they can't go ahead with the drilling around T. Vardis Kloof uh, with the dam being in the current state and that amount of water whatever it is or was, uh, but then had to be subtracted from the augmentation the volume they're talking about getting from the TNG aquifer. Um, so um, I haven't really got an opinion on the farmer versus the city uh, issue. I'm in the city, so yes, I'd like more water. Uh, but if we take the water away from the farmers, then we're going to be just in um, uh, underproduction with agriculture. Key crops won't be uh, irrigated. We'll be paying more. There'll be shortages. So whichever way you take it, there's going to be a, a knock-on effect, I think, with the, the situation as it is. Uh, um, so I don't know if Anthony uh, has got a more uh, rude-eyed opinion on the, on the farmers versus the city um, aspect of, for example, t Basel's proof allocation. Anthony, can I put yes, that I'm, to you? Yeah, I'm more than happy to deal with it. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put my hat on as the editor of, of the journal Water Policy because uh, we deal with this kind of issue at, at, uh, you know, uh, often. Um, in my responsibility as editor of the journal called Water Policy, I'm, I, I'm responsible for the whole of Africa. But of course, Water Policy is a global journal, so uh, I'm familiar with the uh, policy-related problems that, uh, that, that uh, arise from the water sector. And this is a universal problem. It's not a South African problem. It's, a, it's just an absolutely universal problem. And the, the reality is that government has got a very difficult uh, job to play because they have to regulate uh, fair allocation of water between different water users. And each water user has got a legitimate right in some way or other. And this is where it gets very difficult. So, for example, um, uh, agriculture uh, has got what's called a low assurance of supply. And strategic water users have, as defined by National Water Act, a very high assurance of supply. Now, what assurance of supply means is the guarantee of six things at any one moment. And I'll tell you what these six things are now. It's a guarantee of a given volume of water at a given pressure, of a given quality, at a given price, in a given time, and at a given place. Those six elements are guaranteed. Now, if you take the strategic water uses as defined by the National Water Act, which consists of Eskom and Sassel, those two strategic water users need a 98% assurance of supply, which means that one year in 50, they can have a breakdown, only one year in 50. Agriculture has got a sliding scale of assurance of supply. So in, in years of abundance, they can have as much as a 70% assurance supply. So seven years out of 10, they're going to get water. Or in a bad year, they can have as little as, as 30%. Three years, three years in 10, they're going to get water. So it's that assurance of supply factor that's very important. And this is what the regulator needs to do without fear or favor. And let me just, just, just wrap up this conversation by putting in some very interesting numbers because people get very excited when their own personal water appears to be at risk. But let me just give you some numbers. A human being can survive on one liter of water per day. And you can survive in that. Uh, one liter of water per person per day is survival level water. You won't die, you won't be happy, you'll smell bad, but you'll survive. You need about 250 liters of water per person per day, much more than the 88 liters they're currently getting. You need 250 if you're going to live a reasonable quality life. Then you're going to wash your clothes, you're going to wash your body, you're going to, you're going to maybe prepare your food, and you're going to maybe, maybe prepare a little bit of a food garden or something like that. That's 250 liters of water per person per day. The, the water for drinking and the water for, for sanitation, etc., is all municipal water. And I call this small water and medium water. But now it gets interesting. For every calorie of food that a person consumes, there's an approximate one liter of water per calorie 
in there. And that is called virtual water. That's the water embedded in food. And a typical person will, will eat 3,000, 3,500, maybe 4,000 calories per day. So a typical person consumes 3,000 liters, three tons of water per person per day in food. Now, the other day when, uh, when, when Peter asked for my comment on the, or that wasn't Peter, it was somebody else, uh, Benoit asked my comment on, uh, on that, uh, that little video that went viral about the, the, the water at Tervatis Kloof. Um, and they were quoting numbers there about cheese, etc. Those are the virtual water values in different products. Now, we have to make a choice. Are we going to die of thirst or are we going to die of starvation? That's, that's, the, that's the stark choice we have to make. So the, the, the answer is we don't want to die of any of those things. We have to balance it out. So we, the bottom line is that we need to still have water for agriculture. Agriculture is an incredibly important stakeholder in this whole game. And in all of my professional uh, engagements, I have always found the organized agricultural community extremely willing to engage. And I've also found them as being technically capable of making a difference. If we have just a 5% saving of water in the, in, the, in, the, in the agricultural sector that uses more than 60% of the total nat national water budget, we are going to have sufficient drinking water for everybody in the country. So where agricultural water is not a problem, it is a solution, and they are partners to be engaged with, not to be, not to be fought against. Thank you. Um, I want to just, if, if you guys, if you gentlemen don't mind, can we have a look at one or two of the, the, the questions from the audience here? Um, Quivis asks, why is Tevatus Kloof empty? We know why full flay is a lack of maintenance of the canals. The other dams are above last year's percentages. What has happened at uh, Tevatus Kloof? Peter, I think that's maybe a question for you. Um, yeah, look, I don't profess to be a surface water expert, so I'm just um, surmising here. But obviously, runoff has been lower this year, the last few years, because of the drought and the climate change that Anthony's talked about. Um, so that's, that's definitely one factor. Um, and then obviously, there's been drawdown for agriculture. Uh, now, apparently, that used to be 60%, I think, of the allocation went to agriculture. And I think the city applied to the Department of Water and Sanitation to have that uh, lowered so that more water would be available for the city. I'm sure Anthony knows more about this than myself. Um, so I think there's, there's two factors. One is the, uh, the lower inflow into the dam. And also that, that dam, if you look at the, the pictures we saw, I mean, you can see it's an evaporation trap. It's, it's a very large surface area and not very deep. So you're losing a massive amount of water through evaporation, especially in these, these hot days we've had this summer so far. Um, so Anthony, I think you, you probably know more than me on on some reasons why the, the dam might be empty and others not so? Well, yeah, look, I, I don't know the specifics about why the dam is empty, so I don't want to venture uh, an answer to, to, to something I don't know uh, the exact details of. What I would like to say is that what we need to understand, we are building in this community of savvy people, digitally connected, very savvy people that understand these complicated questions. So we must, we must ex expand on that base and people must understand more about what's going on around it. So let me just explain at a technical level something that happens in the dam that, 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 that I think is of vital importance. When you build a dam, a dam is a profound insult against nature, if you like, because rivers flow in terms of what's called a flood pulse. There's an actual pulsing of the river that's driven by climatic events or rainfall events. And rivers generally have a high flow and a low flow. And in, in many parts of, of South Africa, some of these rivers are episodic. They, they, they only flow once in a few months, maybe even if you go up to Namibia, some of those rivers only flow once every decade or maybe even more. So the flood pulse is an important concept in a river. But when we build a dam, we, we immediately attenuate that flood pulse. And what a dam does is it captures the pulse, it captures the peak flow, and it stores it in the trough. So think of, think of a battery that you're charging. The battery's empty. So there's a negative value, you're not putting energy into it, you're charging it, become a positive value, then you're drawing the battery down. So it's that peak flow that we are capturing in all cases uh, and restoring it for future use. It's the flood pulse. So, 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 good, so good so far. Now what happens is you, you now start having different thermodynamics in your water body. The problem in many South African dams, and this is it's a generalization, but it's certainly applicable to Tevatis Kloof from what I've seen. 
is that because of the of the of the relative age, and Peter will, will hopefully support me on this, our geology in this part of the world is relatively ancient. And because of the old geology, we don't have deep valleys. We've got severely deeply eroded places where the, where the high ground has been eroded away. So we, uh, generally, most of our dam sites happen to be shallow, which means now there's a mathematical relationship that, that, that is relevant now. So let me explain that mathematical relationship. When you store anything, the, the, the most efficient form of storage if you want to take a ratio of the surface area to the volume, the most efficient storage is a, is a, is a ball, a round, a round thing, a sphere. That is why a water drop is the shape of a water drop, because it's got the smallest surface area for the largest volume relative to that size. Okay. Now we start going into some interesting things because our dam, because of the geological profile, we don't have any other good sites to build dams in. Therefore, we're obliged to have dams that are relatively shallow with a very, very large surface area. So the, so the ratio of the surface area to the volume is out of kilter. That is why the deep, high dams of the Lesotho Highlands are so important, because if you look at the profiles, uh, Benoit recently published uh, or put out some very interesting uh, uh, diagrams, uh, profiles of these dams. And you'll see that Katsi Dam, for example, is, I think if my memory serves me, about 180 meters deep. Now, the Val Dam is, for example, 40 meters deep. I don't know what your wife is true of it, but it's a relatively shallow dam. So now, as your drought hits, kicks in, initially your, your water starts, uh, starts evaporating, but you start getting thermal stratification taking place in the water body. Fundamental physics okay, kicks in. So your, the, the water on the top of the surface gets relatively warmer, and the water in the bottom gets relatively cooler. And this sets up a thermal gradient, and you start getting 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 a, a, a movement, a current in the dam. And this is very very interesting because as that current starts happening, you start getting algae growing, and as algae grows, it means that the light is unable to penetrate the depths of the water. So you start getting a warmer a warmer body of water on the on the upper surface of the of the, of the dam. But as your thermal the differential increases, well, what's called delta T, the, change, the difference in temperature of the, of, the, of the hot and the cold portion. What that does now is it starts siphoning up or driving up sediments that are, that are stored at the bottom of the dam. So you now start getting nutrient cycling taking place in the dam, and this creates blooms of algae and all kinds of other stuff. But now we get to a, a very, very fascinating thing. When the dam becomes 30% full, the thermodynamics change in a, in a fundamental way. So, so, the, so the reason why a dam drops in level faster from 30 to, to 20 when compared to 90, 90 to, 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 to 80, for example, it's much like your, your, your petrol gauge in your car. Uh, your, your last quarter always seems to go faster than your, than your first quarter does. So it's, it's, it's not the same reason, but, it's, a bit, but it's, it's, a, it's an easy way to explain it. So therefore, what happens is you start getting runaway evaporation. And the reason for that is quite simple. Because you've got, now got a very shallow body of water over an incredibly large surface area, so that ratio of surface area to volume has changed now in a completely unacceptable way. So you've now got a large surface area, small body of water, relatively high temperature because the sunlight warms the water, and you now create an evaporating pan. Now, to get back to the groundwater story, if the, if the groundwater plan, and I'm not saying that this is the plan, but if the groundwater plan is simply to discharge the water into, into the bottom of the dam, which is now a hot, dry, sandy substrate, then all you are going to do is you're going to probably lose, I don't know what the exact number would be, it would have to be, be, be validated through some scientific testing, but I would say as a thumb suck, I would be very surprised if you get more than 20% of your water out the other side. You could lose as much as 80% on route. I don't know what the exact number is, as I say, but that's what's going to happen. So that's why we've got to have a well thought through plan and I'm not opposed to any of the plans. We've just got to understand the fundamental physics and chemistry. We've got to integrate the, the technical expertise we have in the country. We have to depoliticize this whole matter, and we have to arrive at the solutions that are socially acceptable, technically viable, and economically uh, financeable. But th th those are the three criteria that I need, that I think we need. A, a okay, question I have. I come in here with the comments? Sure, sure. It's just something that I understand, um, and something that might be of interest to uh, the viewers. Uh, something 
as you said about the uh, the geology, the, the fact we've got old geology in the Cape, uh, which is quite correct, and the, the impact that has on, on dam geometry, if you like, it also has a big impact on the uh, more recent aquifers that we we have in the Western Cape. You know, we've only got two two of these uh, coastal aquifers, sand aquifers, that's Atlantis and Cape Flats. Um, and the reason we've only got fairly limited um, available groundwater from those aquifers, or one of the reasons, is because of the old geology, we haven't got what they've got in Europe and in the United States, where these aquifers are sometimes hundreds of meters thick. Uh, for example, Atlantis aquifer is probably a maximum of 40 meters thick. Cape Flats, I think, is also 40, 50 meters at its maximum thickness. That, that's relatively shallow. So we, we've got a relatively small uh, base from which to start abstracting groundwater from these um, recent aquifers, whereas uh, like Los Angeles, San Francisco, close to the, the mountain front, uh, I think it's the Sierra Nevada, those aquifers there are hundreds of meters thick. Um, so what we're left with is mainly these old aquifers like the TNG aquifer, uh, which is a consolidated, it used to be a sand, but over millions and millions of years, it's been consolidated into a hard sandstone quartzite, which has then been fractured by various uh, tectonic events over the millennia. And that's our other uh, major aquifer, which is uh, thousands of meters thick. But unfortunately, it's got a much less um, storage capacity because it's only fractures that have the groundwater in and not the uh, individual horse spaces uh, around sand grains. So it's just something on the background of uh, age, geology age and, and Cape Town's aquifers. So, so if I can just, uh, just respond there, the important thing is that geology matters and everything has got a specific ge geological and a geographic relevance. And this is an important point because ultimately the, the, the one thing I've learned in my, in my time in the, in the water sector, there is no single silver bullet solution. And let me give you an example. In my capacity, I used to serve in the CSIR as a fellow, as a senior fellow. And part of my role there was to, to, to be the vice chairman of the RAP, the research advisory panel. And then the RAP, the role of the RAP was to, was to oversee all of the parliamentary grant fund money. So every single research project in the country that was funded by, by what we call PG money, parliamentary grant money, had to come through our oversight on a regular basis. We had to account to parliament for the expenditure. And one of the PG projects that the CSIR has run for probably, I don't know, maybe two decades, maybe longer, I don't know, was the, uh, was the Atlantis Aquifer. The Atlantis yeah. Aquifer is probably the single most studied aquifer in the country. And one of the groundwater experts that's in this mix here, uh, which hopefully is listening to this, is a former colleague of mine from the CSIR called Christine Colvin. She's now with WWF. Very, very technically competent groundwater person. And, 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 and I, I, I kept on butting heads with, uh, uh, with these groundwater people saying, yes, all good and well to, to study the, the Atlantis aquifer as it is. But number one, how, how replicable is that information to other aquifers in the country? Now, can we just say we've learned this year, we're now going to apply it in 10 other places? And the answer to that is, well, you can't. And the second thing now is, so, so what are we going to do about learning about all the other, uh, other aquifers? And to me, the, to me the, the thing I could never understand in South Africa was this whole concept of managed aquifer recharge, aquifer storage and recovery, which has now become so incredibly important globally. And yet all we've done is we've done limited work on the Atlantis aquifer. And I say limited, and, I, and I'm not being disrespectful to the, to, to the uh, geohydrological community that have done a very exceptionally good work there. But I'm talking about at a national level, we've under-resourced that research. We didn't put enough money into it. So we have not replicated that knowledge in other parts of the country. So we now get to a situation where while we know a lot about one thing, we might not necessarily be able to apply that to something else. And just in closing this, 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 this part of my statement, what I find fascinating is I've, I've been very deeply involved in the Stockholm, the Stockholm water, water prize scenario for the last couple of years. And in fact, I've nominated two of the Stockholm Water Prize laureates, uh, 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 and I'm very proud of that fact. But one of the Stockholm Water Prize winners, the Stockholm Water Prize is the Nobel Prize for water. And one of the Stockholm Prize winners, at, at that particular year, I nominated an acid mine drainage project uh, that, uh, that, 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 that Anglo-American had been driving, an incredibly good AMD project in the Pumalonga coal fields. And I nominated that for the Stockholm Industry Water Prize. And it was shortlisted, and it was picked at the post by California. 
and it was a California managed aquifer recharge project. And that was the first time that I really started started understanding or, or coming to grips with the, with the value of managed aquifer recharge. Subsequent to that, my son, who is an engineer working in Australia, took me to the to the Perth Wastewater Treatment Works, the, the Biniap Wastewater Treatment Plant, where they've been implementing a substantial uh, 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 managed aquifer recharge project uh, uh, based on recovering 120 megalitres a day of recycled sewage, and, and it's an incredibly sophisticated project. And this is the kind of thing that we should start thinking about if we, if we want to get serious about it, and I'll get back to my opening statement, the way you define the problem defines the solutions you're going to go for. So if you think the problem is only a short-term, temporary little headache because we've got a bad drought, then you're not going to find the appropriate solution. And this is the, this, if I've got an axe to grind, that's the axe that I've got to grind. We must define the problem correctly. And then we must reach out to this incredible expertise that we have in South Africa. And we must build our own or rebuild our South African expertise and bring that to bear. We don't have to import any fancy solutions. We can actually do pretty much all of the stuff ourselves. I'm not saying we mustn't import stuff. I'm just saying that we must start rebuilding the technical base of our water sector that has been decimated over the last two decades. Can I ask you a question? I, I recently learned that the Western Cape water supply system um, until or since May 2016 was run by a professional service provider. And since then, the Western Cape water supply system is without the services of a professional service supplier. Is that in any way... Um, jeopardizing us making it through this through this drought well once again i don't know all of the technical details there's lots of de the devil's always in the detail in these things but if you don't have a water services provider well it's a no-brainer then clearly you've got a problem because these systems uh, uh, can't manage themselves if you get back to what i said early on for 350 years we've mobilized incredible ingenuity and once you're in the ingenuity game you're now on a treadmill and you can never get off that treadmill because the demands for ingenuity increase faster and faster and faster. And the minute you try and slow the treadmill down or get off the treadmill, you get thrown off that treadmill. So here's a classic example now. Unfortunately, now we get into the politics of water, and this is where it gets ugly and nasty. The politics of water are such that your big infrastructure development projects that are all run by your big state-owned enterprises are create all kinds of funds for all kinds of people to... Uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, get involved in. Let's just leave it at that, okay? This is part of our problem. We've got to depoliticize that. We've got to bring honesty and integrity back into the way we, we call for tenders, the way we allocate tenders. We've got to create enough jobs for everybody, and this is what we have to do. And we can only do it by depoliticizing the space. And, uh, I mean, how can, you, how can you seriously consider a world-class city that doesn't have a proper technical water services provider. It is it is ludicrous. It is it is it is laughable. It is almost verging, in my humble opinion, on criminal negligence. If that's the way it is, I'm not saying it is like that. But if it is like that, well, then someone's going to ask some very serious questions. How did it get to be like that? I, I in my you know, I find that baffling. I mean, first of all, if you if we are to navigate this crisis situation, we need leadership that we. Um, that we can trust, not just leadership that we can trust, but more importantly, we need competent people. Have you gentlemen, for example, made your services available to the city? Yeah, if I can perhaps go first here. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I certainly have. Um, uh, in, on two levels, really. One is years and years ago, I, I broached the subject of um, uh, investigating the TNG aquifer for supply to the city. That was back in the 90s. Um, I gave presentations to the then uh, uh, city's water engineer, and it met with a very um, low-key, well, you know, we, our pipelines are full. Uh, it's a drop in the ocean. Um, basically, we don't need groundwater. And that was a, a constant theme, not just from, from Cape Town, but from a lot of uh, municipalities back in the 80s and the 90s, where groundwater was very much the Cinderella um, water supply option. Uh, it wasn't spectacular. Bores aren't particularly sexy. Uh, you'd far rather have a big dam and a big pipeline. Um, so on the one level, I, years and years ago, decades ago, I was uh, approaching the city, different people in charge then, 
And then last year, about September, I think it was, I had a meeting with a, one of the top uh, water people in the city and had a, a couple of ideas where there might be some more groundwater that could be cut out of the system or systems and offered my services. I'm semi-retired, I've got time on my hands, 42 years experience. I said, I think I can help. And it's been radio silence ever since. Um, I haven't made a nuisance of myself. I haven't uh, been knocking on doors because I'm not particularly interested in full-time employment. But um, certainly there doesn't seem to be any interest in employing people such as myself to um, supply some additional expertise to help speed up and help peer review um, the studies that are being done by the, the city's chosen, I was going to say consultants, but I think it's on um, groundwater, it's consultant. Okay, let me respond then. Um, I've offered my services uh, to the National Planning Commission when it was constituted. Uh, it was rejected. I've offered my services uh, in many ways to the Department of Water and Sanitation. It has been consistently rejected. The current Minister of Water Affairs, Mambula Mokanyani, when she came to power, I made a public statement to the effect that I fully endorsed and supported her, and I was hoping that we could work together. I've been systematically and consistently isolated, and I've never had a chance to actually look at her face-to-face, -face. and despite the fact that one of her advisors is a close colleague of mine from my former profession, and we know each other very well, and we've, we often talk to each other, that notwithstanding, I've been rejected. I've also offered my services to the DA and to the city in various capacities. Uh, in all cases, it's been rejected. My services were offered pro bono a short while ago to one of the uh, members of parliament, one of the very, very senior DA leaders. Um, I was told that, uh, that they're going to contact me. Uh, that was in uh, November last year, November, December last year. Still waiting for the phone call. And I was recently, as yesterday, been in contact with senior DA people where I took the courtesy of informing them that I was going to put out that public, uh, that public uh, document that I put out on Facebook yesterday asking those questions, so they were forewarned that they knew about it beforehand. I didn't jump uh, jump uh, on top of them. So the bottom line is I'm more than willing to be available. I, I, I'm more than happy to do a pro bono. Uh, I, I don't want to make any money out of it. That's not the issue. I'm approaching retirement, and, my, and this is, uh, this is uh, something, uh, a subject that fascinates me. And you must appreciate one thing. Uh, for anybody that knows me, you've got to understand that I'm, I'm an odd, strange animal. And part of my oddness and strangeness, I'm very proud of. I'm very, very proud of that oddness because I am a service-oriented person. I believe in service. I, I've been a loyal member of the security forces. I have served. I have been in the front line of creating the democratic dispensation that we have today. Some of my colleagues have given their life for the democratic dispensation that day. And I don't want to bore you in the details, but, but through, I've been personally involved in helping establish this democratic dispensation. So as a veteran, I am very, very concerned, and I believe that I have the right, because I'm proud of being... Uh, of being a service-oriented person, and I want my country to succeed. I want the DA to succeed. I want the ANC to succeed. I want the city of Cape Town to succeed because that's what we deserve as a young nation. We deserve to all reach our full our full potential as defined by, of all things, the Freedom Charter. So I'm actually I'm a supporter of the Freedom Charter and the, and the uh, the Constitution that uh, was drafted as a result of uh, some operational work that I was directly involved in, in establishing Cadesa. So, so that's, that's my position. I'm quite, I'm quite firm about that. But the other thing about my oddness is that I, I, I'm not afraid of, of anybody and I will stand my ground and I just, because, because I've got nothing left to lose. So therefore, take me on, I'm, I'm more than happy to bring it on. And uh, let's, let's argue facts, let's talk facts, and let's, uh, let's talk in the public interest. What is good for our country? What is good for every citizen irrespective of race, color, creed, political persuasion, sexual orientation. I don't care about any of those things. What is good for South Africa? And I hate to sound like Mr. Donald Trump to say, make America great again, but let's make South Africa great again. That's what we have to do. Gentlemen, can I ask you, moving forward, um, you know, we don't want to harp on what's negative. In your opinion, for us to gain water security, which is what we're all after at this point in time, what will it take? Do we have the do we have the expertise locally? Do we have to import the expertise? Um, do we have the funds available? What is the hindrance? What is hindering us from moving forward towards water security from where we are now? Anthony? Hi, Peter. As I said, I'm just a simple geohydrologist. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, I've never, never been one to be afraid of questions like that. Uh, okay, I think, I think, you know, we can make it complicated or we can make it simple. And I believe that there's a simple reality out there. And that simple reality is that we've reached the limit of our available water. This is not a temporary disturbance. This is the new normal. And the good thing that's going to come out of the Cape Town water crisis is going to be a complete new awareness amongst the public, amongst, amongst the uh, private sector, amongst hopefully government. If government doesn't become aware, then I'm afraid other things are going to happen with them and they're going to be bypassed. So I don't want to sort of, sort of threaten that, but I just think it's important that government becomes aware because the, the population is becoming increasingly dis, uh, disenchanted with it. So, so, so what do we need to do? I think number one, we need to understand that this new normal is a permanent situation. It's not a temporary thing. It is a global phenomena. The world is running to the limits of its water. We've got, we're going to have 10 billion people on this planet in the next century, and those 10 billion people have to live with the same volume of water that we currently have available. It's a fundamental problem. So we've got to get smart, and we've got to, and it's quite easy. We have to make a policy statement, and I put out the other day on my Facebook page a very simple proposed policy. Policies don't have to be complicated. And that, the reason why we must make a clear policy statement is because that creates certainty for investors and technology providers. So it's interesting, just as an aside, in my, in my offline conversations with, uh, with various political uh, leadership in the recent past, they inform me that everything that I said on my Facebook page has been found somewhere or other in some little document somewhere. That's not the point. The point is there must be a clear and unequivocal policy statement. And let me give an example. If you, want, if you understand that, 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 that the, the, the new normal is about a fundamentally water constrained, water and energy constrained economy. If that is the new normal, then we as clever human beings, homo sapiens, the wise people, we can solve these problems. So let's solve the problems. So we're going to manage both water and energy as a flux. A flux is something that moves in space and time. A stock is something that you have a volume of once, you deplete it and you throw the rest and you throw the garbage away. Throw it away as waste, okay? So we've got to understand that water is a flux. It is infinitely renewable. And therefore, we, when we put out proposals, we can't put out a little Mickey Mouse proposal for a desalination plant, for example, that limits the time for 24 months because no desalination plant in the world can be economically viable if you have to pay back your capex cost in 24 months. So if we're going to get real about this, we're going to say the new normal is the following. Okay, here's the policy statement. South Africa is a fundamentally water-constrained economy. Uh, the legitimate demands of human consumption have now reached the limit of available supply. That is the, that is the, the, the point of departure. Okay? Now, therefore, we recognize that water is a flux moving in time and space. It's an re infinitely renewable resource. Therefore, we base our future on technology, and we're going to base it on three legs. And these three legs are as follows. Leg number one, the recovery of water from waste. And there are all ways of doing that, and we can talk about that another time. Number two, the desalination of water where appropriate. And you note, I don't say seawater, because the desalination of mine water is a big industry right now. And right, right now, I'm working at one of the most sophisticated desalination plants in the country that desalinates mine water. So we already know about that. So desalination where appropriate. Doesn't mean to say everywhere, where appropriate. And the third thing now, and this is where, where, where Peter will hopefully uh, support me, uh, I don't want to fish for support, but I hope, hope I'm saying the right thing. We must manage our groundwater resources in a conjunctive way, which means that we can draw them down during times of drought, but we must replenish them in times of plenty. So by managing our groundwater resources, not just as a source of water, also as strategic alternative storage, we must get, take our dams off the surface of the, of, of the earth where the cl climate change is increasingly going to Erode or, or, or evaporate the, the, the water, and we must put it underground where the smart economies are already going. That's it. Simple as that. So we do that, and I think we're going to have a bright future. This is what I call the, poly, the, the, the paradigm of abundance. And as I'm sitting here right now, I can pick up the telephone and I can talk to fund managers that right now are raising 10 billion rand, and they are looking for a fund. They're looking for a project of the scale, the heroic grand scale. Let's call it the half train. Let's have a half train type of project 
of that magnitude down in the Western Cape. And let us invest seriously into that thing. Let us restart, kickstart that economy. Let us give everybody a job, not just the, the privileged few. Let's give everybody a job. Let's use this as the Marshall Plan, if you like. The Marshall Plan that turned Europe around after the ravages of World War II. Well, that's what we need now. The Marshall Plan in the water and energy sector, because both water and energy are flip sides of the same coin. That's, that's my position. So this is actually we should we need to look at this as an opportunity to reboot basically to reboot what we've done in the past um, to to have a new relationship with water as we move forward. If anything, I think every single citizen has learned that that value um, of of water that we need to respect a resource um, and and not misuse what we have. Um, I, I like what, what Sandra is saying in the comments here. She's saying Band-Aid solutions will never work. And, and in my opinion, that, that is what we possibly are doing at the moment um, is Band-Aid solutions. But we need a longer-term solution. It's a strategic problem that needs us. It, it is soluble. And, in fact, let me just make another quick little statement. Let, let's, those people that are interested in the English language, please, uh, please uh, cross-check me when I, was, when I say what I'm about to say. What we are facing in South Africa is we're going to use the, the, uh, the, the English word of a dilemma. And a dilemma is something for which there is no apparent solution. That's why you sit on the horns of a dilemma, because both alternatives or all the alternatives are equally unappealing. So our role as technical scientists, engineers, technology providers, etc. Our role is to convert that dilemma into a series of problems, because a problem is something that is technically soluble. So if we understand that there's a series of problems, we convert the dilemma into a series of problems, the good news is every problem is technically soluble. And here I want to go back to the grand, the grand scheme of things again. When I was a young man, I was incredibly impressed, incredibly impressed. It formed my, my thinking for the rest of my life when Robert Kennedy uh, decided to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely within the next decade. We must do that same thing. We must decide as a nation, that we are going to turn our economy around by becoming a value added, a beneficiation economy, because recovering water from waste, recovering water from sea, doing all these things is nothing more than a beneficiation economy. So we must be bold enough to say that we as a nation demand that beneficiation economy, and that's simply what we have to do. And once we've got that, 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 that big aspirational statement out there as a policy, I tell you something, you're going to have all sorts of capital all sorts of technology, you're going to be spoiled for choice. You can cherry pick uh, of these things. But we're thinking small. We are thinking in the paradigm of scarcity. We're thinking that someone's trying to steal, steal a little bit of our, my slice of the pizza pie. We've got to make the pizza pie bigger. Gentlemen, I want to thank you very, very much for your contribution. Any final words in closing, Peter? Well, just some very banal words, really. I'm sure everybody has been in a situation where I have, where you go on holiday or something, you're stuck in a grotty hotel, and you're thinking, what the hell am I doing here? A few weeks, months later, a couple of years later, you're looking through your photographs, and you, oh, look at that. I remember that time, but uh, you look back at it almost with fondness. Um, and I think perhaps in two or three years' time, once we've got this um, terrible uncertainty out the way, uh, the new paradigm is here, um, as Anthony says, this is not going to suddenly go away and we'll, we'll be back with no water restrictions in three or four years. It's here to stay. And I think in three or four or five years, we'll be looking back and seeing how we, we being everybody uh, that can get involved in this, has solved the problem as we're a more assured uh, course with our water supply. We're never going to get back, I don't think, to where you're washing down your driveway with uh, hose pipe water um, or you, you're, you've got a lush green garden that you're irrigating every day. I think in Cape Town, those days have gone, and we'll be adjusting over the next few years to that reality, and hopefully it's going to be as painless as possible, and day zero doesn't come. I'm not too optimistic about that, but I think, as I say, in three or four or five years, which is not all that far away, we'll be looking back, and not with fondness, but sort of thinking, well, yeah, we had this problem back in those days, but look how we, as Anthony said, look how we put the resources to it, and look what we've done, and be proud of where we are. Before I ask you to close, can I ask you, gentlemen, one more question? I know I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, do you believe we are going to see a day zero? 
or can we avert it? Ideally, Is yes. it possible? Okay, well, well Peter's answered there. Um, I'm already on the record with uh, some international media that I've been speaking with. Uh, I believe that day zero will happen. Um, what the actual probability is, I would, uh, I mean, I haven't done the actual calculations, but I would venture something in the order of a, between a 60 and, a, and an 80% probability that day zero is going to happen. So that's that's the reality of it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, let me just say, say one more thing, please, okay? In my professional background, I've got personal experience with dealing with very complex problems. And, and we're, what we did, and I don't want to sort of keep harping on this, but back in the, in, the, in, the, in the days when the intelligence service was doing some significant things to bring about the transition to democracy, we were given enormously complex problems to solve. And we learned through a culture of, of working the problem. Any engineer works a problem. We would work that problem backwards in an infinitely complex way. So we, we became masters at understanding uh, a risk. So now let me just quickly close off by saying that the problem here that we have, or the, or, the, or the risk that we are running as a nation, is all of this noise we're putting out, all of the hana hana, wara wara, all of this bad news, pointing fingers, and I'm not responsible, and somebody else, and they did this, and I didn't do that. It is all sending negative signals out to the investment community. Now you can you can you can you can make a decision about whether you think that we need to create jobs in this country or not. If we want to get serious about economic de economic development, economic growth, poverty eradication, we have to create jobs. We can only create jobs by restoring investor confidence. We cannot restore investor confidence unless we have a very clear energy plan, a very clear water plan. And we've got to align ourselves at policy level, the national, provincial, and, 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 uh, and, and municipal. They must all say the same things, okay? Because that is going to restore uh, the currently lost investor confidence. We don't want capital to fly out of Cape Town. That's not in anybody's interest for that to happen. Gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you for the energy that you've put into this conversation. And I hope that I can invite you both back soon again, because this conversation must not die down. The country cannot afford for this conversation to die. We cannot afford radio silence. Radio silence is what causes panic. Information empowers. Um, and thank you for your willingness and thank you for your time and thank you for joining us today. Getting, sorry, I don't want to hijack your last you. moment. Can, can I just say one last thing, please? One simple last thing. I want to put this in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the audience's head, if I might. I told you earlier on that I was deeply impressed when Kennedy said they're going to put a man on the moon and bring him back. What's interesting about that is that triggered the desalination technology drive because they could only put a man on the moon and bring him back safely by not taking water with him because water is too heavy. So they had to learn how to recycle, okay? Uh, but but, but, but uh, uh, that, 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 that's not the point. The point I want to make is that when Apollo 13 went pear-shaped and as they were stirring the oxygen tanks on the way out to the moon, and suddenly there was this famous radio message, Houston, we have a problem. That's where Cape Town is today. Houston, we have a problem. And what happened then was very significant because there was my hero, one of my heroes, a guy called Gene Kranz, who was the mission controller. And what did the mission controller do? He looked at all of his engineers. He looked at his entire control panel, his entire control team, to the cream of the crop. And he looked in their eyes, and what he saw was fear and trepidation. And he immediately realized that what he needed at that moment was to be a leader. And leadership meant he looked at everyone in the eye, every single one. He went down the, down the road and looked at them. And he, and he gave some very important instructions. And the first instruction was lock the door. Nobody's leaving until we solve this. The second instruction he said was preserve all your data. The third instruction he then said was failure is not an option. We are going to bring Apollo 13 back again. This is our Apollo 13 moment. We have got, now got to emulate what Gene Kranz did, and we've now got to look at everybody in the eye, the groundwater guys, the desalination guys, the, uh, the, the whatever, the, the, the people that make water from air, whatever. They've all got their little place in the sun, okay? We've got to look at all of those people, and we've got to focus on one thing. We've got to bring Apollo 13 back safely again. That's my closing statement. I totally agree with you. I can't agree more. 
failure is not an option. And I know someone put a hashtag out there, which I like, um, hashtag never again. May this never again happen to Cape Town. Um, let's find a solution. Let's move forward. Let's be positive. Let's keep the economy intact. Um, gentlemen, with that, thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.